Hey guys, welcome back to a Life Education's podcast again with Zoom. Caroline, myself, and we've got Andrew Hallam back on the show, all the way from Victoria in British Columbia in Canada, from nine hours behind me and from, I think, 11 or 12 hours behind Caroline. So um, we figured in this current climate, uh, what better person to speak to than a, someone who knows how to help people knuckle down with their savings and protect themselves financially. So. Um, we have a couple of episodes with you already, Andrew, which were super popular and super enjoyed by people. So, um, for those of you who don't know Andrew, very quickly, author of a book, A Millionaire Expat, um, has been talking to us a few times in the past, does talks all around the world on financial kind of strategies, how to save. So, we're here just to pick your brain, Andrew, and see, see what we should all be doing right now. <laughs> so, welcome. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the invite. It's good to see you guys in Ireland and uh, Dubai and Canada all connecting. It's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. yeah. It is really cool. Yeah, that's it. So, I mean, to go straight in, I wonder, like, the markets are crazy. Businesses are, are closing down. People are going on these strange hiatuses. Like, we've talked briefly just before this um, about the lockdowns and things like that. How is it? How do you see it happening over where you are? Firstly, like, what's the major thing in the news with economy? Like, what do you see going down in Canada? It, it gets a great question, and here it seems like the the main focus is really people's health. So, economy seems to be second. Um, we don't have the same numbers of people that they do in the United States. We're saying, let's get back, let's get the economy going again. Um, I, I'm really glad that I, I think at least Canadians are a little bit more level headed in terms of the, the long term picture here. Because uh, if in the US they start relaxing their, uh, their social distancing standards, and, and let's be honest, the US is just getting started with this. They are just getting started. It's getting worse and worse for them. And you've got them talking about relaxing social distancing standards. You've got Donald Trump talking about doing much the same thing. Um, it's going to be it's it's going to be kind of scary because they're going to end up facing several waves of it, which is going to hurt them economically. That's what's going to hurt them economically. So if we put people first, and you see the countries that have done a really great job of that, New Zealand's done an amazing job of that. I think Canada's doing a pretty decent job. It really looks yeah. like. Dubai. I just pulled up the numbers here. So I just wanted to interrupt you there. So right now, currently we're at 2,500,000 if these statistics are correct. So I'm just going to find Canada just to get an idea of where Canada's at. Um, and I'm looking for you. Do you know where you guys are at? <laughs> no, but when, when you look at numbers, look at per 100,000. So that's always the key. So yeah. it, it can be really misleading. You can get a country with a large population doing an amazing job and you'll look at number of cases, number of deaths, and it may seem high. So you have to go based on a, a, a per 100,000 basis or comparison. Okay. So um, here you guys are at 37,000. And if it's, so I've got the statistics for the per 1 million population and it's hmm. 14,000 per million. Mm. Yeah, it's in a, um, well, 14,000 for how many cases in Canada, did you say? Uh, 37,398. So then you then you have to divide by 35 million. So um, you'd have a, a far lower ratio per 100,000 or per million than you do in the United States. Um, and it's, the U.S. is a lot of, uh, it's interesting because it's like a bunch of countries wrapped up into a one country there are a bunch of uh, in many cases mental freelancers is what i call them you go through certain states where people are doing an awesome job at social distancing and then you go through other states where it's just a goon show and so they're saying well you're taking my rights for you know making us do the social distancing and it's, i mean if it weren't so tragic it would kind of be funny but i guess we have to see the dark humor and what we can't control and hope that they're able to get at least some levels of consistency and they can start adhering to some of the standards that other successful countries with this are, are adhering to. So that's what's going to help people in terms of their health. And it's what's going to help people in terms of the economy long term. Um, bringing people back to work earlier isn't going to help the economy. It's going to drag out the pain because you're just going to end up getting a second and third wave. So, so my hope is that with the U.S. they can uh, they can get that, get that sorted out get some influential people to stand up and say you know what we're going to start to be really consistent with this so um what is it like for you over there in canada right now with with your and what are your lockdown laws like 
it's like for me it's is actually not so bad we have so i'm in a city right now of about mm, 350,000 ish people and we can go outside we have to keep social distancing um it's advised that we keep like 20 feet away from say a runner and 30 feet away from a cyclist yeah. and not everybody is adhering to that because that's a new it's something that's new based on some of the latest research on you know, how far these little molecules can travel when somebody's going past on a bicycle or when somebody's breathing heavily running so most of the people up until about a week ago were just adhering to that sort of six and a half foot distance but i went for a run yesterday and i made sure that i pulled wide wider than i have been doing in the past and people have been doing the same thing so people are listening to the news the prime minister is on every day so every day he's calming people talking about um again the social distancing measures the progress that's been made the challenges that are still being faced and so it's been a really good um so i think it's been really good for the people in terms of the fact that there's strong unity and everybody's really on board here with one single enemy and that enemy really is the virus and and we really need to kill that and look after people first economy second and of course as i mentioned before if we look after people first the economy will end up thriving faster earlier as a result of that we just can't rush it so what kind of advice would you have for people who are really struggling with the idea of like okay yeah i can understand health first economy second but if you've lost your job and you've lost the ability to to earn an income and you have maybe you've lost a lot of your portfolio or a lot of the other ideas it's kind of like making people feel really unstable and like they've just had the rug pulled out from them what advice would you have for them yeah the the hard part of course i mean i think it's any in any case to try to remember to control what we can control so almost put together like a t graph of something on a piece of paper and say okay what can i control all right i can't control the fluctuations in the stock market nobody ever can so that's not something that we should ever try to worry about we can't control the fact that if we're not going to be employed we don't have a job we can't we can't necessarily control that the so same sources of revenue are going to be there for us. But I think what's healthy for people is to try to figure out what they can control and start to put that in place. So one is a level of education in terms of let's control what might happen a year from now or six months from now when the economy gets going again. So one might be a level of financial education. So from this point forward, putting together a plan where many people don't know how to invest their money for the future and they don't necessarily think about putting money aside for a circumstance such as this, like having that three to six months worth of living expenses set aside in a, in a savings account. What we don't want to do is we don't want to say, use words like should have, could have, and would have, because those are completely soul destructing. That's, yeah. that, that, that doesn't help anybody. But what does help people is to say, all right, now let's set up a plan for when I do get things going again. Um, how do I effectively invest my money for the future? And let's put together a plan whereby I can put together, put aside in the future small amounts for an emergency fund, especially if we end up getting like a second or third wave. This virus won't be the last virus. I mean, we have you know, 10, 8, 15 years from now, we may end up with something similar, unfortunately. Bill Gates has been talking about that for years. Um, yeah. It's just a reality. We, we're, we're, we're more and more globally congested as well. We can travel like we never could before. So things like this can spread far more prolifically than they ever could have in the past. So back to the controlling aspect, um, to try to learn, I think, as much as we can so that we can empower ourselves and not necessarily beat ourselves up over the mistakes that we've made. There's also ideas of looking at like alternative sources of income. And whether it works out or not, at least you feel like you're working in some kind of positive direction. So if it were like, like a personal trainer, I don't know about you guys, but how, how I'm so curious, because I know you guys have a lot of people in the fitness industry who are, are li who listen to your podcasts and your talks and such, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I'm really curious about um, to what extent are many of them looking at or have many of them looked at? You could talk about sort of historically and current, but to what extent have they uh, tried to leverage their expertise? So my sense is that like, let's say you're a personal trainer and you're working one-on-one -on -one with somebody. 
Um, it's, it's kind of a, it's cool because you're, it's a, it's a life altering, it's life altering work. It's, it's some of the best work that anyone could ever do. It's amazing. Like I've seen so many people with their lives been completely transformed by great personal trainers. Um, the part that's really challenging is that for a personal trainer, you have, if it's one-on-one, -on -one, you have one source of income per client. If you're doing like a boot camp, okay, great. You're lucky. You're doing one you're, you're the one person and maybe you have 15 people in your boot camp. So now you've got 15 sources of revenue that dries up. Tell me about the online world. So that's what I'm so curious about because I know that so many really successful um, personal trainers have leveraged a platform on say YouTube and they've ended up getting and generating income by having clients all over the world. So they could have clients, essentially just people watching what they're doing or subscribing to their channel. They could be make, making money from just the ads associated with YouTube channel by just putting out free stuff. What have you, what are you guys seeing and how successful have people been in Dubai in that respect? I think when you look at the world of YouTube, there's a select few that are like the cream of the crop right at the top, getting hundreds of thousands of views on their social media, or their, their videos. So they're probably, unaffected by this if not making a bit more money because more people are at home tuning in but, but i think pretty quickly when you come down a tier or two you, you move away from that high earning ad revenue and you get into the people who maybe have some form of youtube presence like with a, with a low amount of of followers where they're getting a small amount of ad revenue but it might not be enough to cover you like their expenses their, their mm -hmm. rent whatever but it's a little bit of supplementary thing most PTs in Dubai that I know uh, are solely gym based. So they're, whether it's boot camp or one on one, it's still that time window and it's still that physical presence that they're selling and that expertise in person. So there's been a lot of people that have been heavily affected by this and you're just kind of counting on savings, getting them through this little time period of when the gyms are closed. The clients are still active. The clients are still doing some stuff at home. There's still communications there. I know for me and my guys, we're still in comms with the, with the clients. Um, it's a bit difficult for me to run the Zoom sessions that some guys have moved to because of the time difference. Um, some of the guys in Dubai are looking after my clients. So they're running, they've got like six or seven clients on the screen and they're giving them kind of conversations over this over the the internet but again the training then is all done with which is body weight and whatever kit that people have so there's been a lot of um sort of improvised solutions we come up with there's a hybrid though of some pts in dubai who've had some online clients so they spend maybe half their week physically in the gym with their with their human contact people and they have clients all around the world that they just sell programs to. So part of their business has been unaffected. So they're still bringing in some revenue from their online clients, but they were a little bit of both. So they've also lost a massive amount. So it's, it's, a, it's a funny one because, again, lots of PTs then won't be on a basic salary. It's, it's a purely commission-based. So depending on what financial position the gym is in, some PTs are – being supported with a little base salary some pts have been like many industries laid off temporarily without any salaries and then some on the commission salaries are just look it's the same as it was you earn the commission on whatever you earned you know but because we're not earning anything it puts up a massive roadblock and it makes makes at times a little bit anxious a little bit nervy yeah, I think from my perspective, I've seen a lot of people move into the online community. I've also seen a lot of people being very in innovative, where they're using this time as almost like a business uh, innovation kind of time, where mm -hmm. they're working on the progression of their business. And then some other people that are just, you know, really they've lost their jobs entirely. They're in really challenging situations. So it's, it's a little bit of both. And I think for a lot of people, it's their ability to adapt to the current situation. Um, and it really depends for a lot of people, and this is what I've been hearing on how long this lasts. So some people are like, okay, well, if this is two or three months and we're two or three months in lockdown, then that's, that's okay. I can manage that through my savings and, and through other strategies on maybe taking some clients online. And I think for other people, if this goes beyond six months and we're here until after the summer and potentially into, into the end of the year time period, I think a lot of people are really uh, in a tight financial 
position. So it's interesting, Andrew, to speak to you and to get your insight on maybe what people can do in terms of their mindset for a short-term period and then as well into a long-term, okay, well, how do we, how do we look at long-term understanding and maybe some mitigation strategies? I don't know. What's your advice on that? <laughs> I mean, I'm not an expert on that, but I do think about like the mental aspect. I think it's probably the most important part. It's recognizing that um, do you, you, I think you set some kind of positive plan. Like I think Caroline, you're, you're alluding to that too, with the reorganizing your business, trying to figure out how you can make it more effective in the future and what other possible sources of revenue, even if you're not creating those sources of revenue right now, just the idea that you're, you're thinking about them, putting possible sources of revenue into play or at least structuring them. I think that it's so important that people have hope you have to have hope. If we don't have hope, then, then everything just falls apart mentally, um, physically. We need to have that, don't we? Yeah. So, Andrew, do you know what's really interesting? Something that I always remember about hearing your lectures and when I, I came to Dubai and listened to you talk, um, I remember you telling me about all of the fluctuations of the stock market. You had a big graph and you were like, uh, during the depression and then there was this massive dip and then there was another time period in the 80s and then there was another time period um, obviously a 2008 crash and something that stuck with me was okay the we've survived all of these disasters throughout history and the stock market just continues to move and over time it, it goes back up again so I just want to know if this is one of those time periods again or if this is what some people are saying, like this is the end and we're all changing <laughs> to a different, um, like a different currency. So what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? And uh, what do you think about that? Well, it's really interesting. And too, I think we have to really be, be conscious of the people that aren't working. And so for me to say that I really enjoy stock market drops because I can add mon more money to the markets, which is, which is true. I guess what it is when I say add more money, it's not that I'm adding more, but I'm getting more for the money that I am adding to the market. So if unit prices of the markets drop, the same amount of money that I may have been adding two months ago is now buying a greater percentage of those shares within the indexes that I'm purchasing. So the, the market drops are something that I've always really liked. Um, I don't like the reason that markets necessarily drop in terms of, okay, right now, so many people are out of work. We have so many people that are sick, but it's a bit of a silver lining when I see prices fall, because I know that when I'm purchasing, I can purchase it at, at, at better and better deals. The, the really interesting part to me so far is that um, this market hasn't really fallen that far. So if I look at the, some people might be like, what, well, you know, if, if they really freak out and think I'm totally nuts by saying that, they're probably watching the news too often and in watching the news, they are focusing on what the news does best. The news loves to focus on the scary stuff and the news kind of, ah, uh, that's not interesting because that's kind of, you know, positive in a lot of people's minds. So we're not going to, we're not going to talk about that, but I just, I, I look back 12 months. So I look at my investment portfolio 12 months ago. So April, uh, last time I looked at it was April 15th, um, 2019. So I went, well, April 15th, 2019, what was my investment portfolio worth? And what was it worth April 15th, 2020? You might be surprised to know that it was worth about the same. And, and a lot of people would be like, what? How, how is that possible? I mean, anyone with a diversified portfolio uh, in stock and bond market indexes, would probably be in about the same boat. I looked at uh, Vanguard's life strategy funds, which are really popular among British investors. And I recommended them in my book, Millionaire Expat to um, British expats. You can buy them through Swiss Pro. They're fabulous products. They're diversified portfolio indexes wrapped up into a single Vanguard fund. So they have a, a British stock market index component, a British bond market index component, and a, uh, a global bond market index component that's sort of split between developed international and, and, uh, and uh, emerging markets. And it's rebalanced once a year, or at least it's rebalanced uh, fairly regularly with the inflows that come into people's, uh, into, the, into the Vanguard fund itself, such that let's say it's 60% stocks and 40% bonds. Vanguard more or less maintains a pretty constant allocation. But even the life strategy funds, if they were 
60-40 ish, 60% stocks, 40% bonds. They're about the same level that they were at 12 months ago. So what the markets did was April 2019, they rose a lot. Like they really did rise kind of a stupid amount. <laughs> Stocks went really, really high, and that's that's what happens. I mean, it always happens. The market short term is completely is completely nuts, um, and then dropped really heavily. The market ended up dropping really heavily at the beginning of March, um, and then in three days, like I think it was from March 23rd to March 26th, the market went up 19% three days. Um, that doesn't make great news. People don't like that because it's not so scary. Uh, it seems like headliners love scary stuff, uh, and then the markets have kind of up and down, up and down really since that point. But a globally diversified portfolio such as mine or my wife's or probably your, even yours, is at about the same level today as it was 12 months ago. So I'm not getting the deals yet that I'd hoped we would for the market. My hope is the markets will fall further, a lot further. And, and if you're retired, you're 70 and you're 80, by all means, you'd probably feel like throwing an egg at me right now and you'd be really upset. But um, it's kind of like golf, you know, every putt makes somebody happy in golf. And <laughs> mm. the market directions are exactly the same way. So for me and for you, um, we're adding money to the markets. We're not old people who are pulling money out. So we really should be hoping for sinking market prices, especially if, of course, we have an income to continue to add more money. Even if we don't have an income and we're not continuing to add more money because we're struggling, Sinking market is good for that person too because these ETFs that you will own pay dividends and those dividends get reinvested into a greater number of shares. And when the market drops, those same dividends can buy shares, fractional shares at, at lower prices. So if you're young, falling markets are the best thing that we could have going for us. How does everything- Yeah, do you know, I think- Sorry, yeah, keep going. Well, no, I was just going to say, no, no, no. how, because yeah, like you said, watching the news now, last night, the news talked about how oil has gone through the floor and it's now at minus value. So you, you would then um, from a, a position of zero awareness of what's happening in the market as a, as a broad, you take that as a reflection of everything must be down, you know, down the tank. How does, how do we, where we are now, whatever it is now, end of April, how does that compare to the post 2008 dip and the problems? Like, are we on the, are we still on a down? Are we on the way back up or have we sort of, are we just bumping up and down? Like you mentioned, is that how it's going to continue? Well, I don't even think about the, the best thing is not to think about the future and say, are we going to, or what are we doing presently? We can only see the past. And so nobody knows what will happen in the future. We, we know that from um, the market drop in 2008, the markets really ended up falling um, 2008 down to the trough in 2009, which would have been March. Markets ended up falling about 50 percent, five zero percent. We had a similar drop from 2000 until the bottom in 2002. It was about a 47 percent drop. Right now, um, U.S. stocks year to date, I think year to date, are down about 12 percent. But over the last 12 months, the U.S. stock market's up about one percent. So I checked yesterday and found that the U.S. market up about 1% over the last 12 months. So, um, yeah, I wouldn't really call that a screaming, a screaming discount or a screaming deal. Uh, I like the fact that it's not more expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and so my, my hope is that markets continue to fall um, and that they fall a lot further. Stocks and bonds or stocks and uh, the stock market will always fall a lot further than it ought to fall. And so we measure it based on business earnings. And we can see how expensive the stock market is relative to business earnings. And that's a true level of expensiveness. How is it doing relative to typical business earnings? And, uh, and the interesting thing is that if earnings recede, stocks always drop further in percentage terms than the recession in earnings. And it's just as a result of people's short-term fears. Likewise, if the same thing happens in the, in the uh, inverse when earnings are strong. Take uh, Amazon, for example. Amazon's income is up significantly as a result of this because people are staying at home and they're ordering in. So Amazon sales have increased a lot. But Amazon's stock price has risen twice as much as the actual sales have risen. So that's equally Ill illogical. That doesn't ever sustain itself either. But you can't get that. Typically, if 
uh, Amazon sales have risen 20%. Amazon stock price should have risen about 20% if the market were totally short-term rational. But it's not short-term rational. Likewise, if a company or if uh, the general market as a whole, uh, businesses as a whole, drop their earnings by 30%, you would assume if the market were totally rational that the stock market would drop 30%. Generally, it won't. It'll drop, often it'll drop further because people get far more, uh, they feel far more fear. So we're dictated by short-term fear and greed. And as investors, the best thing to do is not to try to predict anything, just if we have the money, invest it and invest as soon as we do have the money and just continue to invest and actually forget all about market levels. Don't even think about any kind of predictions or oil prices or stock projections or coronavirus issues as it relates to the economy and just continue to add money when we have it to our investments. What kind of questions, what kind of, what kind of uh, communications are you having with people who are looking, they've got money ready to go and they're looking to invest. Are they fearful? Are they, are they on the fence one way or the other? Like what's the sort of industry, yeah. to industry for you? What's the advice you seem to be giving people a lot of? That's an awesome question, Keith, because anytime you end up getting a period of economic turmoil, um, and I'll look back at 2008, 2009 as a, as a prime example, I'm seeing much the same thing. So what people will do is they'll even read a lot. They could be really, really smart and recognize that, okay, we know that nobody with any degree of consistency can actually time the market. So by timing the market, let's say you've inherited a hundred grand and you're wondering, should I invest it right now or should I wait? Just by asking that question, you're thinking about timing the market. If you just invest it as soon as you, you have it, you're not timing the market at all. You're just investing it right away, which is what I would do. But most people will tend to want to time their, their, their stock market purchases, especially during a time period like this or during a time period like 2008, 2009. And what's really interesting about that is that um, Morningstar, is, as I probably talked to you guys about this before, but Morningstar is a fund rating agency company that ends up looking at how funds performed over a given period of time and how investors in those same funds performed over that exact same time period. So let's say after fees, a fund earned 8%. We would assume that if investors were totally rational after fees, the average investor in that same fund would have earned 8%. But they, they don't. It's really weird. Um, when times are, when people are unsure about the markets, they hold back and they don't typically want to invest. And they often invest more when they think things have stabilized. But as a result of that behavior, what we've seen is even among like index fund investors, and index fund investors are supposedly those that will never typically you know, they believe that, uh, that they, they shouldn't be speculating, that they should just be adding their money. Even with index fund investors, when you get, say, a period from 2003 to 2013. Now, within 2003 to 2013, we had 2008, 2009, right in the middle of it, which was this crazy period where nobody really knew what was going on. First of all, no one ever knows what's going on. But it's especially when you have something like that, people get really, really freaked out. And the average person ended up underperforming even their index funds by about two and a half percent a year during that time period. And, and I think we've talked about the tyranny of compounding losses or the opportunity cost of a two and a half percent underperformance over a lifetime. It's massive. And that two and a half percent over that, that, that 10 year period is gone forever. Like they don't get that back. So that's money that can't continue to compound. It's going to be, Keith, much the same. People are saying to me, Oh, you know, Andrew, it, we're, I know that market timing doesn't work, but I've just inherited $100,000 and I want to wait until things stabilize. Or I think markets will drop further if, you know, and I think I might want to buy when it's lower. All of that is just monkeying around. It's like uh, we have really primitive brains and we know that probability is such that the longer our money is in the market, the better off that we end up doing there's no guarantee that if you invest money now, it won't be cheaper later. But if you start down that road of speculation, you're going to continue down that road of speculation probably for a lifetime. So when you look at probabilities, probabilities are best such that when we have a lump of money or when we have money at all, invest it right away. So I'm going to end up getting a payment of $10,000 and I'm waiting for it. It'll be two or three days from now, maybe a week from now, I don't know. Um, I'm going to be getting paid at some point. And I don't look at the market. 
I don't look at where it is. I don't try and figure out where I think it will be or if it's a good deal. I just invest it. So I've been doing that forever. Um, I guess, since, I mean, this is my 31st year of investing. I invested at the peak of 2007, right before the crash. Because I was investing every month. But I invested all the way down to January, February, March. So I invested at the very bottom as well. And as a result of having invested at the peak and investing at the bottom, I ended up paying a lower than average price for my units just through that process of that dollar cost averaging. And again, because I can't see the future, if I inherited a million dollars today, um, today's Tuesday, markets are open, I'd invest it today. I don't care that the markets are higher than they were two weeks ago. I don't care that the markets might or might not be lower two or three months from now. But what I do know is this, if I inherited some money today and I invested it today, I do know that 20 years from now, it'd be worth a hell of a lot more money than it's worth today. And what, so what do you see, are people having those conversations now? Are they trying to say, listen, this is gonna dip more, let's wait a bit longer. So that's, is yeah. that, the, is that the kind of conversations that are going around? A hundred percent. And it always is. It's uh, people will believe that they're not going to be speculators until um, <laughs> until they have to face some kind of uncertainty themselves. It's, it's like I, I say this to people, too. I say, you know, investing is really simple, but it's not easy because of the speculative component that people bring into it. And so many people will say to me, like, um, um, like I think I shared with you guys that I guess I guess it was 10 years now I ended up getting cancer. And, uh, and fortunately, I had great surgery. I recovered really well from that. But it made me realize that nobody really knows how they're going to respond to getting cancer or losing the use of their legs until they actually do. So you could ask somebody and say, so, like, you know, if you lost the use of your legs, you know, how would you do? Would you, would you be positive? Would you, would you, you know, take up, like, wheelchair basketball or wheelchair racing? Or would you hit the gym hard? Or what would you do? Um, and people will try and tell you, but they don't know. They do not know until it happens to them. And it's the same with investing. Like markets will always go through periods of turmoil. And so many people are like, yeah, psychologically, I can totally handle it. Piece of cake. I can do it. But I find that most people can't. Um, most people just can't. They will think that, all right, intellectually, on an intellectual level, they'll say, I get it. Don't speculate. Add money as soon as I have it. And as I get more money, continue to add more money. Um, but very few people, Keith, very few people actually have the emotional fortitude to, um, to not speculate, especially during times like this. And that's what makes us really bad investors. We tend to have really prehistoric brains and we tend to think of just what's happening this week or this month. And we only think of what's short term. Even if we think we'll think about what's long term, most people really do have prehistoric brains. Um, and that's, a, that's unfortunate, but it's just the reality of investing. And is that the only mistake that's happening now? Or are you also seeing people saying, hey, no, let's look this direction and let's all invest over there or let's all focus yeah, on, yeah. on this, you know, with the oil prices dropping. Are you seeing a shift, people trying to jump on that? And yeah. yeah, exactly, Keith. So people are trying to move their money around. They're starting to talk now about buying like an oil ETF or a gold ETF to protect themselves. Um, and they did this in 2008, 2009. Um, people again did this in 2000, 2003. They did this 1973, 74. They did this 1987. This is what they always do. It's just, it's just one of the weaknesses of human nature. What I get a kick out of is looking at the professionals that try to do this. So we have professionals that try to do this full time where they'll look at where they think, what they think the best asset class is going to be going forward. And what they'll do is they'll take a, a fund and, uh, and my favorite is to look at are these funds called tactical asset allocation funds. So imagine Caroline's portfolio and she can buy any exchange traded fund that she wants. And let's say right now she has like a global stock index and a global bond index. And then Caroline, let's say she's a professional. She's like an analyst. And she's like, you know what? I'm going to buy uh, a, some gold right now and I'm going to buy an oil ETF because it's cheap. So she sells a little bit. She shifts over to gold and oil and then she decides she reads some kind of news she has her finger on the pulse of the economy she decides that for some reason she's like you know what small cap stocks in korea are i know they're going to do really well so she's going to shift some of that potential oil money into a small cap stock market etf that's based on south korean stocks anyway this is what a tactical 
uh, asset allocation fund manager does. They shift money around based on what their forecasts are of the future. So you think it would be a really um, sophisticated process whereby you get a lot of results out of it. Um, you'd think that you'd get much better results than somebody just simply owning a global stock index and a global bond index. But um, I've done several studies looking at Morningstar's data on it. And it's so, so interesting. Um, the first study that I did was in 2018. And I believe it was uh, the Morningstar had, um, I was tracking 180 of these funds run by these professionals that would be moving money around like this. Um, and it's different to a typical mutual fund because a typical mutual fund might be U.S. stock market mutual fund would just be buying U.S. stocks. Uh, an international mutual fund might just be buying developed market international shares. But the tactical asset allocation fund manager, as I mentioned with Caroline's example, can move and shift that money wherever they want into whatever sector they want. They could even pull it all into cash if they think the markets are going to drop. So anyway, in 2018, I wrote this article called um, Why Your Investment Portfolio is Like a Bar of Soap. And the idea is the more that you move the soap around in the shower, the smaller the piece of soap gets, right? And, and I, Morningstar had tracked 182 of these things that had five-year track record, so 182 fund managers. And I found that out of the 182, 15 of them had actually beaten a portfolio like Caroline's, or like yours, Keith, which is global stocks, global bonds, right? And so I thought, well, that's interesting enough. Let's track those 15 now. So the 15 winners that would have beaten your portfolio or Caroline's portfolio, let's track those 15 winners from the day I published that article, which was June 2018, and see how have they done today. And so now they would have been contending with the coronavirus. So you'd think that professionals with their fingers on the pulse of the economy would be able to move their money around in, such that they could make money on behalf of their investors by, by tactically shifting their assets. Uh, but it turns out that all 15 of them would have underperformed your portfolio and Caroline's portfolio from June 2018 to April 15, 2020. In fact, they got hammered uh, this calendar year. They got absolutely hammered. All 15 of them got hammered. So, so my point here is that you can see people that have done well in the past by tactically allocating their funds, um, by moving things around. But invariably what happens is uh, speculation ends up biting them in the ass eventually. And the best statistical way of, of making money going forward is not to speculate, build that diversified portfolio, global stocks, international stock, uh, bonds or global bonds. That's a really simple allocation. You'll be 90% of the investment pros. Don't speculate, invest money as soon as you have it. And if you can even have more money over time, continue to add more money. So then we spoke on the last podcast, the second one that we did, on the difference between property and investing. You open some now. Your theme seems to be hold the line, which is what you've always said in the previous conversations we've had. Hold the line, hold the strategy, keep putting money in. Try not pay attention to the chaos. So uh, you, you, you held that line as well with a little bit of the property conversation we had last time. I'm guessing this is a silly question at this stage, but are you still on that line? Now, some people are looking at some properties, the price in property changing, do we hold back? Do we do, what do we do? Do we buy one, do we buy two smaller ones? I'm guessing, but I don't want to put words in your mouth. Where, where, do, you, where do you lie on that now with the property in this situation? But yeah, it would be much the same in terms of when you're buying a property, you're buying a business and you want to maximize the yield with all other things being equal. So I've always said that, um, a single apartment is one of the worst investments you could make because you know, you're paying strata fees or management fees associated with that building and you've got one source of revenue. So if you're renting it out, you have one tenant, one source of revenue. A little bit better, the yield tends to be a little bit better with a single family home, but it's still not great. So it's not a great investment. That's why uh, property gurus don't go around buying, like uh, billionaires don't go around buying single family homes. Uh, they buy apartment blocks. And we can't maybe perhaps buy an apartment block, but we can buy a duplex, like a two unit place or a three unit place or a four unit home, giving us four sources of revenue. And so it should always be compared, we should always compare the revenue with what we actually pay for the property, divide them and figure out what the actual yield is on that. So 
it's a business purchase, much like somebody's going to be purchasing a corner store. They do exactly the same math. Geek. They use the same math on that equation. So it's going to be challenging now because you, you may end up finding that you buy in a place whereby uh, there are few new tenants are going to be few and far between. So it's going to be really tough. However, if you can float that mortgage, um, the Chinese symbol for danger and opportunity is basically the same. It's it, we have an opportunity here. Property prices have dropped significantly, and if somebody can actually float the payment and float the mortgage, um, this can be an opportune time. But they have to be, have done the math on this to recognize what is the revenue going to be, or what would the revenue normally be for the rent. And is there a decent earnings yield relative to the price that the person's paying for the property? It all boils down to that, not mm -hmm. speculation in terms of, um, I think the property is going to rise in value. I mean, that's one of the dumbest reasons to buy a property. I think it's going to rise in value. Um, most property gurus don't think like that. That's stupid talk. It's about, yeah, let that be the icing that, okay, property values, they do rise over time. But let that be the icing on the cake. The cake is the earnings generated from the property. That's the most important aspect. Got it. Yeah, very interesting. Um, so let, for a meathead, non-financial expert here, last night I heard on the news, oil prices dipped to a negative price for the first time in history. How, how I heard that. So, yeah, the Middle yeah. East is panicking, the oil prices are dropping, people are going to move over to gold, we're going to unpeg from the dollar, like it's panic, like this has <laughs> never happened before, we're all oil economies, so anyway, go keep Yeah, no, so, so my question was simply, like, how do you, I didn't understand it, I don't know, I mean, what I'm guessing is, it seems that the oil traders can't shift their barrels, so now they're paying people to take them. <laughs> why, would, why would anybody, am I right with that firstly? And then secondly, why would anybody do that? How, is this, how has that happened? Aside from the obvious that there's no demand for oil. Like, how does this situation come in the finance world? Well, the, the, in, in a nutshell, when we say no oil, oil is at, at negative prices, this is really, really interesting because you have a couple of things that have been going on at the same time. One, of course, is we had already low oil prices before any of this. Um, we had all of the infighting between countries and between distributions and distributing the sale and selling the oils. And we know we had a lot of turmoil before the coronavirus issue hit. So we had oil prices that were significantly depressed. And then you get this thing where now we're staying indoors and we're not driving anywhere. So people aren't using fuel. Aircraft are not using fuel. So now it costs money to actually store oil. It's expensive to store. So what do you do? And there's an oil production and all of a sudden there's a, a mass supply. And these, these oil production companies are like, oh my God, this is costing us money to actually store it. I mean, so this is one of the reasons why, this is really the main reason why we're at, at negative prices at this stage, because they're literally paying people to, get, to take the oil from them. You take it, you store it. We can't afford to store it. Um, because the, the supply or the demand for it is, is, is so low right now. It's funny because my dad was just saying, ah, I, I, I fuel, fueled up my car like six weeks ago and, uh, and I still have like three quarters of a tank of gas. <laughs> so, oh, bless you. Sorry. As it, as it relates to um, the future, we do know that uh, for better or worse, it's still an oil-based economy. When this all settles down, eventually we're going to be out Airplanes will be flying. People are going to be driving their cars. Um, demand for oil is going to increase. And yeah, the price of oil, of course, will rise slowly. So we're still an oil-based economy that's still going to happen. Uh, many people are, again, going back, Keith, to your, your previous question, many people are going to start to speculate. They're going to start to buy oil, um, oil-related stocks, um, like, you know, like Exxon Mobil or, um, or purchasing their own Oil, oil, oil company based ETFs, oil and gas industry ETFs. And, and I suppose if you're going to be a speculator, um, this is one of, the, one of the smarter moves that people could make, but only if they're really going to hold it for a really long time period. Most people who are speculators, they can't. They, they freak out, they jerk around, they follow news. Um, again, back to the human nature component. 
most people would have a really tough time knowing that, well, what if my what if Exxon Mobil's price drops further? Absolutely it could drop further. So they'll be really shy to resent to pull the trigger on Exxon Mobil shares or on a, a stock market ETF that included oil and gas industry shares. So yeah, bring bring it back to human nature. I'm not doing any of that. Um, I have a diversified portfolio. I know within it, um, I have a large component of oil and gas within my Canadian stock market exchange traded fund. So as a Canadian, I have a Canadian component. Um, the Canadian stock market is down about 22% year to date. So it's down quite a bit further than the U.S. stock market, really as a result of the fact that Canada has a... Uh, a large U.S. Uh, a large uh, oil-based economy in the province of Alberta specifically, so that's just creating an opportunity for me to continue to add money to my indexes, and uh, and I'm kind of in a way indirectly capitalizing on what will be eventually, obviously, a uh, higher price of oil in the future. But I'm not doing it just based on oil; it's much more diversified. So I just stay the course and do the same thing I've always been doing. Yeah, I think I think that seems to be the advice, and that's what you said to us the first time we sat in uh, Steve Cronin's back garden, and we watched you give that talk. What you said on the podcast that we did the first time, and the last time we spoke as well, when we were in the coffee shop, we spoke about property, and it was always just whatever is happening, just just stay the course and wait for the bounce back. Yeah. yeah, I guess you know, what's, what's really interesting is that every other time that we've spoken, we've spoken about things that have already happened in the past. And so it's very different when you're currently in a crisis, particularly because this one is so different to some of the other financial crises that we've had. This one you're saying like, oh, I know that in the housing market crash, you saw people lose their homes, but here is people's health. And you're seeing the whole world economy just come to like a halt. I've never in my lifetime ever heard of the airline industry not flying, countries closing their borders, not letting anybody out or anybody in. Like particularly here in the UAE, we have to get a permit to leave our house. We have to wear a mask. We have to wear gloves. Mm -hmm. um, so these situations are really new for people. And particularly if they're concerned about job security or the stock market. And, and then on top of this, thinking about their well-being and thinking about mm -hmm. their own health, it's another factor. So even though all the other times you've, we've spoken, we've spoken about things that, oh yeah, it's very easy to, to look in hindsight and go, okay, this is, this is what happened in 2008, this is what I need to do. But then when you're currently in a crisis, especially one that's so different, it's, um, it's a little bit different. Yeah, and every, every crisis is different. So the people in 1929 had never been through that before. Um, the people in 1973, 74, um, they'd never been through that before. The people that faced uh, the Cold War and, uh, and the, the Cuban Missile Crisis, where we were at the edge of nuclear war, whereby it would have been all over for all of us. We'd never been through that before either. The narrative is always different. It's always different. It's always a, we've never had this before. But the, the thing that's really important to remember is that we get through these things. We've always got through these things. This one, arguably, um, is easier to get through than many of the others in the past because jobs aren't gone, they're just frozen. The, the job is, and the demand is still there, it's just frozen until we can kick this virus's butt. It's not like, you know, I, I get a kick out of the news and them talking about unemployment figures and comparing them to 2008, 2009. And I go, yeah, but you're just, you're just citing the obvious. There's a reason we're all in this voluntary lockdown and we've created this ourselves to help people. That's why we've done this, right? As a, as a society globally, which is actually kind of cool when you think about it. We've, we've put, maybe for the first time in history, we have put people and their health first which i think is awesome once we kick this virus everything is going to get up and running again businesses will be up people will be working again people are going to be obviously driving their cars and buying buying more things um, businesses will on aggregate end up making more money um, and unfortunately the stock market will eventually rise i say unfortunately <laughs> because I, the longer it can stay in a nice depressed state, uh, the better for people who are actually in a position to be buying. But yeah, Caroline, the narrative is always different. 
Um, it's always a, this has never happened right. before. Um, we're going to get another narrative that's never happened before either. You're going to see two or three of them during your lifetime. And your grandkids are going to be saying things like, oh, Grandma, this has never happened before. And you're going to say, let me give you a history lesson. Every time there's been a turmoil, it's always been a, this has never happened before. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, uh, it's just something that we're going to get through. And in the end, hopefully, uh, as humanitarians, uh, we're going to be a lot stronger as a result of this. Yeah. You know what? That's a really interesting point of view. When you frame it like that, it's like, yeah, we never went through the Great Depression. Yeah, we never went through a housing market. So it's an interesting perspective on, on how to look at things that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, I mean, I remember in 2008, 2009, it was that the, the, the financial, the entire financial industry, the entire financial market we're on the brink of collapse. Like our banks were on the brink of collapse. And once your banks have collapsed, that's all. it's game over. It's game freaking over. You can't borrow money for your business. Other businesses can't borrow money for their businesses. It was a 1929, oh my gosh, we're like, here it comes. It was, it was absolutely, if you could put yourself back into that place, it was absolutely horrific. We had Lehman Brothers, which was the largest investment bank in the world, file for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Um, we had long-term capital management, which was a hedge fund, which is a series of global hedging against the market that almost brought down the global economy. Like, oh my God, it was huge. Right now, the global economy is just on pause. It's just on pause. And once we kick the virus, we are going to go back to work and we're going to start buying stuff again. I'm not saying that this is worse or not as bad as 19, uh, 2008, 2009. It's a different narrative. And it always will be. We will go through several different narratives during our lifetimes. And every generation will say, this is the worst ever. Maybe it is and maybe it isn't. But what we do know is we get through these things. Um, and, and hopefully we become better as a result of that. Amazing. Well, you, you, in a weird way, you fill me with a lot of optimism now after this conversation. I thought we were going to go down a different path and be, be thinking, uh-oh, we need to sort of learn how to hunt. And her and her and <laughs> ourselves. <laughs> but yeah, no, that's excellent. I think we'll wrap it up on that um, pleasant point. Where can people follow your stuff, Andrew? And just want to run off the, the titles of your books and how people can learn from you in more detail. Yeah, they could. Uh, I mean, I've got my, a blog at andrewhelm.com where I publish the articles that I'm doing. The People could connect with me on LinkedIn. And so I'm publishing things like occasionally I'm, I'm I'm experimenting with YouTube, so I'm putting that YouTube video up, and I'm putting pretty much everything on on LinkedIn, so people can connect me there. Um, my book, Millionaire Expat: How to Build Wealth Overseas, available on Amazon, Kindle, and paperback. Um, so, yeah, I'm easy, easily reached. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you for taking the time, um, Caroline. Thanks for leaving, staying up so late in Dubai. And let's uh, <laughs> let's hope next time we meet, we can all sit down again and. Give lots of hugs and hands and everything. Everything goes back so much the way it used to be. Yeah, real connections. It will. It will. Yeah. For now, air hugs. Yeah. Yeah. Hugs. Hugs. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Andrew. Have a great day. Thanks, Thanks. Andrew. Take care, you too. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. Bye.